Hey everyone, thank you for coming to the Camino Cafe podcast, whether you are watching us on YouTube or listening to us wherever you get your podcasts. If you are tuning in for the first time or you haven't subscribed yet, I hope that you will hit subscribe right now. And if you're enjoying what I'm doing with the Camino Cafe podcast, I hope that you will give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. Through those ratings and, and through the subscriptions, it helps the podcast get out there. More people will find out about it. And I would really appreciate your support in that way. So today's episode is really, really special to me as I have a dear family friend that lives with diabetes one. And I had a lot of curiosity about how someone would walk if they had diabetes one or diabetes two. So when I ran across the work of Bob, the diabetes crusader, I started following him right away. And he reached out to me to let me know that he would be in Santiago soon. And we made arrangements to meet up. You will see today's podcast is a little bit different in that I actually met Bob out on the square, and then we went to a couple of different locations to do the interview. So it's going to look a little bit different, but I think the information is really great. And I hope that if you are one of the unfortunate folks that have to deal with diabetes one or diabetes two, I hope that Bob gives you the inspiration and the confidence that you can still walk a Camino. So anyway, let's get to the interview. Welcome to the Camino Cafe. I am live out in the square at the cathedral and I am delighted today to have a special guest with me. I have Bob Scheidt and we'll be talking to him about his Camino in just a moment. So Bob, welcome to Santiago. You got here yesterday and this is your eighth time arriving in Santiago from pilgrimage. So welcome. You must be so excited to be back in Spain. I'm, I'm so excited. I was homesick for Spain. I felt it in my heart for three years, so last year in 2019. And uh, it's like, maybe I'm back. <laughs> and, uh, and I tell you something that I've, I've noticed all the way through second, third, fourth, fifth, Every time you come to Santiago after a long journey like that, it never gets old. It never like, well, I've been there how many times? It's every time it just thrills you to the marrow. And uh, uh, what the, the, the statement I come up with, it rearranges your molecules. Rearranges your molecules. <laughs> yes. Tell me more about that. What do you mean by that? Well, it's when, it, when something, it, they say like when you look at a great piece of art or when you, look, when you listen to a great piece of music, there are certain instances throughout history that this one particular album or painting uh, or book uh, just changes totally your whole inner core, all your molecules, everything that's surging through you is now being changed. And, uh, and you look at things just a little bit differently from here on and the rest of your life. And like I say, I talked to a, uh, a friend of mine who's a chemi uh, chemistry professor and she said that that actually makes sense. She said, in her estimation, anything that rearranges your molecules is good. Wonderful. I totally agree with you. That's exactly how I feel after I walk. So tell me a little bit about yesterday. I mean, we've gone through this whole lockdown with COVID. This was your first time back to Spain. What did it feel like, you know, when you came back through the tunnel over there and you get ready to make that turn and you see the cathedral, no scaffolding this time, how did it feel? I, it, it happened almost exactly like it did before. Now, it did come in the op opposite way already from the, when I came from the Finisterre and Muxia. But um, coming, as I, as I slowly approach uh, the tunnel and the steps, yeah. I hear those first notes from the bagpipes and always I start crying right? every time. <laughs> it's those darn bagpipes. I always have to watch that if I'm at home at work doing something and I hear bagpipe music, I'm going to start crying. I agree, but it, I agree. There's something about that. I always throw a lot of money in his in his bag because that is a symbol of the finish is right around the corner. Literally, you come down, you make the left onto the plaza, uh, the Obradias, and you're, you're complete, you're done. 
your burdens for the moment have been a little lifted. You do not have to get up the next day and repack your pack and walk uh, 20 to 25 kilometers. But it also, there's just the surge of, you go back starting to think of all the people you met on that on that trip, the people you walk with, the hospitaleros. Uh, it just, it all surges. Yeah, it just all comes to, and uh, it, yeah, like I say, it never gets old. Well, that's a great description. I think the surges, and I don't know if folks can hear the background right now, yeah, but the bagpipes playing. are playing, playing as we're talking. Yeah, I did, I, yeah, I did a tear a little bit. So <laughs> well, maybe we'll walk over there in a minute. Yeah. I just want to show everyone the square right now. Uh, right before we started this video, it was packed, <laughs> and I was worried that uh, we wouldn't even be able to pick up sound. It was so noisy, so we're just in a little bit of a quiet spell, but I see a pilgrim right there that just came into the square. So, Bob, you know, you and I became acquainted because I, somehow you and I found each other online. I don't know how these things happen, but I'm really intrigued by your story. You've been walking uh, to really promote the cause of finding a cure for diabetes, and you have walked a lot of kilometers. I, I forget now the total, but like 100, I think it was like 180,000 or something. It's, it's almost that 200,000. Almost 200,000. Yeah, kilometers. Wow. 130,000 miles. So somewhere in there, the yeah, that's um, amazing. Yeah, since and I kept records since I was uh, since I had been diagnosed with type one, which was in 1973. I was 17 oh. years old. Okay. Um, and I just for some reason I kept the mileage journal because I thought I'm gonna do everything I'm wanted to do, even though some of the doctors said, well, you know, with the diabetes it's not gonna be easy. And figured if I would die young because of that, I was doing what I wanted to do. And, <laughs> Years later, as we got more and more knowledge about the disease, um, we found out that actually what I was doing was exactly what you should be doing. Right. Maybe not to that degree, but a couple miles every other day for diabetes, a nice little walk, the family, or that's what you need to do. Yeah, so you're standing here today, I think you told me you were 67. Is that right? Yeah. 67. You've walked almost 200,000 kilometers, and this is your eighth time coming into the square. I mean, that's quite a feat. That is amazing. Congratulations. We're going to dive into uh, in a little bit, a little bit more about how someone can walk with diabetes one, because I think obviously there's some worries for people out there that, um, you know, trying to do the maintenance and do all the things that need to be done uh, to get through the day when you have diabetes one. And I know there are a lot of people curious about, you know, how can you walk with and so we will talk about that in a few moments. But um, right, for right now, I'm going to close out this part of the video and then we will start back up in another location. So Bob and I took a few moments to walk over to the tunnel, right where you come in on the Camino Frances. Here we go. Okay, so Bob and I just moved. We're right by the tunnel. You can hear the bagpiper now playing and both Bob and I are getting teary-eyed. Uh, we were just talking about our stories of entering and Bob, you know, even standing here, it's an emotional moment to hear the bagpiper. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, every time I've come through here, uh, I, I almost forget about it maybe a little if I'm talking to friends who are entering with me. But as I approach the tunnel and all of a sudden the first few notes hit me, I realize, you know, now you are officially almost at the end. And that music starts me tearing up. I sometimes have to stop. It's, it, it happens every time. And uh, I, I always throw a bunch of coins uh, into his bag because I want to, that guy to be there or at least someone doing that. It's so important as you then get to the to the turn to make the left turn onto the plaza at the Albertillo and there you are, you're at your finish. So that bagpipe, it means a lot. And the fact that you're in Galicia, where, you know, the Irish, uh, a lot of them came here during uh, many, many years ago, I think maybe even during the 16, 1700s, it's, um, it's important for that, that bagpipe noise to be there. Mm, I agree with you, Bob. Let's walk, so in case this is a little noisy. Yeah. And I'll just have the camera for a moment uh, at the square so folks can see. Quite a few people have entered the square since we've been talking. Yes, they have. Yeah, yeah Bob, I'm really glad you said There's that because I think the uh, fine entertainers and 
the folks that are performing in the tunnel, it's such a special moment. We want to make sure that they continue to play. So I think tipping them and showing our appreciation for what they're doing is so key. So here we are, we're walking in. You can see Bob right here. And Bob, let's talk a little bit about some of the friends you made this time. Let's um, also, I guess, let everyone know where you started in case they're not Facebook friends with you. They may not be aware of uh, this latest pilgrimage you took. So where did you start? I started in Pamplona way back at the end of February. And um, my plan was to start there because I knew that the pass up uh, from France from Saint Jean Pied de Port would be uh, pretty much in snow and and maybe stormy, and uh, it did turn out. Uh, tur uh, talking to pilgrims who did start there, they did have to do the lower Van Carlos route, and uh, I've actually never done that one. I've done it over the top a few times, but maybe that would have been just a, a new thing too to try the other route. But I did go to Pamplona. I started there and. Um, it was a little difficult for the first week. I could not find albergues that were open. Oh, I had, really? I had trouble in, in sort of the littler towns uh, that there was nothing. Everything was shuttered up. There were no cafes. There was, and I've always carried plenty of food. So I have that. I don't have to worry about that. But, you know, that's sort of a nice thing to pop in and, and, and have a cafe con leche in the morning if it's cool or... For me, I, I drink a lot of Coke Zero, and I just go into <laughs> the bar, and <laughs> yeah, and I and I order just I'll have a Zero, and they right away they know it's they have it everywhere. Now, Bob, I have to ask you, yes. as an American, do you say Con Yellow? Or are you asking for the ice with your with your Coke? <laughs> yes, I do. Yes, absolutely. Yep. Well, hey, let's go get a coffee so we can sit down and uh, we'll talk some more. Okay, great. So after we left the square, we decided to have a coffee and we headed over to Eris Nunes, one of my favorite coffee shops, and we ordered a cafe con leche. Let's hear what Bob has to say. Okay, so Bob, we're sitting in Cafe Nunes right now, uh, enjoying a cafe con leche. And um, I wanted to talk a little bit about walking with diabetes and how you manage. I know there are a lot of people out there who, you know, if they have diabetes one or they have a family member, a friend that has diabetes one and they're planning on walking, that there are definitely some concerns and some things that you have to be aware of for maintenance. So can we talk a little bit about um, some of the tips that maybe you would have for someone who is considering a Camino and they have diabetes one. Could you talk about how you manage it and the things that you do? Yes, I've had uh, type one since 1973 when I was diagnosed. I was 17 years old at the time. And uh, so I uh, it is sort of still what they consider the dark ages of diabetes. We got none of the, uh, I, the I went on uh, long, uh, short acting insulin actually in 1982. I got my first meter in 1982 up to that point. I would go for a once a week uh, blood test, taking blood out of my arm and giving me a reading, which, you know, a couple hours later, which we now know everything changed in those couple hours. It was a guide for the week, but really very, you know, not, not real uh, helpful. <laughs> Uh, I had test tape, which we use in the stream of urine and to see if you were, uh, what your blood sugars were that way. But that was a two hour time lag wow. on that. So many things in back in those days, like I say, it was considered the dark ages of diabetes maintenance. So the big deal was in 82 when I got a, my first meter, take a drop of blood from my finger into the meter and get a blood sugar reading. And now you adjust, you give a little more insulin, you eat a little something if you're starting to go low. Uh, so that was a big plus. In 1996, I went on my first insulin pump right before I walked across America. You walked I, across America, I walked Bob? across America <laughs> in, uh, yeah, from 1997 to, uh, so two months on, 10 months working at home, back to uh, wherever I stopped the year before, another two months walking and back home for 10. And uh, I wanted to do it all in one shop, but that was a compromise that I worked out with my wife. Yeah. She said, yeah, yeah, you can do it, but let's, let's, you know, streamline it a little bit here. So that was in 92 when it you was, got uh, your pump? I got my pump in 96. 96. Okay. And, and started walking across America in 97. Wow. Okay. Uh, then, uh, so the pump was an important thing and I've used it in all the, uh, uh, since then, the improvements that have been made with the pumps. 
Uh, there is still some maintenance involved. I, every three days I change the tubing and go into another part of the subcutaneous fat of my body where I, when I usually go around right now around my uh, uh, abdomen. Uh, there are times I'll do it on the arm or on the leg, but sometimes it's not always. You do have the tubing. Uh, so uh, it, it still works best for me right around there. It's sometimes a problem with the pack belt, putting the pack on. Uh, I was wondering yeah, about yeah, that, you gotta right? be real careful with that. Uh, so, so tell uh, me, tell me a little bit about um, what what all do you have to bring that someone who doesn't have diabetes yes. one would not be bringing? It comes out to about eight pounds heavier on my pack, which is about four kilos. Wow, more weight. I've got uh, I've now got a continuous glucose monitor, a CGM, which I attach to my leg, and uh, that. The, the, I, every 10 days I change that. Okay. You, I brought uh, five of them with in case one would fail. So over those 30 some days, I needed four of them with one backup in case one fails. None did, I still have that backup. And I'm good till I get home now. Um, that's very, they're very heavy. They right. admit, because to administer them, it, you pop it into your uh, into your leg, and there, uh, and then you throw it away. And do you have to refrigerate? Does it... those not? No, those I do not. Okay. My insulin, I carry in a cooler. Um, it it actually cools by evaporation. Okay. And uh, it's amazingly cold in there. You stick your fingers into the container, and your it, your fingers get cold, and that's amazing how that works. Wow! So you're so, having to carry a cooler, yes, plus the insulin. So how much? Yep. So how many days did you just walk on this? I walked Camino? 33 days, and I'm here about 37. So 37 days. So um, did you bring all the insulin, or did you get yes. insulin at pharmacies when you were no, here? No, I brought all my insulin. So you brought all your insulin. And I got to carry that on the plane with me because you can't have that in there where it freezes. Okay. In okay. The airplane. So that stays with me. And um, a few bottles, a few pens as a backup. I don't okay. use pens, but they're there as a backup. Um, and then um, in that cooler, you just make it wet every three or four days and it, and it gets fatter and heavier. Okay. Because it soaks up water and then that's how it cools. Okay. Uh, I have that. I have uh, all my pump supplies, which get changed out every three to four days. I find on Camino every four instead of three because I'm I'm exercising so heavily that I use less insulin. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, so it can be up to four days, and that, that's nice. That gives me, but I still bring stuff with for every three. Once again, I've got three or four changes left, and I'm, I have my last change I did last night. I'm going home with this one on. I don't have to worry about that anymore either. Okay. To fly so, home. so you don't have to worry about the albergue having refrigeration or? No, I used to back when I first started the Camino in 2013, I sometimes put it in there. I was like maybe skeptical of these coolers working, but they even them have, they even they have improved, I think, because I have no problem. I don't even, <laughs> some of the, uh, uh, hospitaleros in the albergues that I've stayed in years ago, I walked into their, into their, uh, this time into the same uh, albergue, and they said to me, "Oh, we remember you. Shall we put your insulin in the oh, refrigerator?" That's so sweet, huh? It's like five of them, I think, get spaced out. Did that same thing, and I'm like, "Oh my God! I was so glad to see you after not being here for many years." you still remember that but i said i no longer have to i have a better system and they seem they seem to work really well yeah. right? I've no problem with that but it, there's some weight involved and then extra food i cannot run out of food it, yeah let's talk about that yeah. so so you already you're carrying in your backpack you're carrying eight pounds to have all of um the maintenance yes. things that you're going to need to have um to control the insulin levels but you're also having to carry food, and you're having to carry more food than yes. the average pilgrim. If the average pilgrim runs out of food. It's, you know, an inconvenience. Right. They might be hungry. They might go to bed at night with no food. I can't do that. Yeah. There's absolutely no re no way I can do that. So um, I bring with me, I, I was sponsored for years by Cliff Bar, and I could probably rework that again sometime in the future, but I use a lot of Cliff Bars. They're you do? Just okay. 
they're so good in 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 they uh, have all three aspects of food, which is um, a carbohydrate, fat, and um, and protein. Okay. Uh, the protein levels are real high, so you should probably supplement that a little. But uh, I carry a bunch of Cliff Bars. I, any so how many Cliff Bars do you have a day? Would you say when you're out walking? Oh, I, I maybe only one. Oh, maybe only one. But and you're... they have their backups. Their backups. Is what they really is okay. what they really are. Uh, and I do resupply halfway through a Camino. Okay. If it's the Frances, it's usually at Leon. It's usually at. Um, um, in a pension because I have it mailed from uh, okay. the, the the post office in uh, Madrid. When I get there, when I first get there on the plane, after the plane, I will mail it and they, they send it there. Hostel Leon is the name of the place. People are wonderful. They're, it's a young couple and they have done this for me for four, all four Caminos. I've wow. resupplied there. Um, and I'll tell a quick story what happened this year. I got, as I was slowly approaching, they said, Bob, your package, they've been emailing me, but your package has not come. I'm like, oh my gosh, what the heck happened? They said, the post office cannot find it, and uh, 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 Carrillos in, Spain, in Spanish, uh, is, I, I, I got nervous. By the time I got there, I thought maybe it had just showed up. They said, no, it's still not here. I go, oh my God. If I can't get that package in a few days, I've got to go home. Right. Yeah. Because you can't get Cliff Bars here? Or the uh, kind that well, you use, I or? can't. But it's mostly the diabetes resupplies. Oh, so you had the extra supplies in yeah. there. Uh, okay, insulin, got it. I have with me all the time because I can't mail that. Right. Otherwise, all my other diabetes maintenance stuff. Um, and I do put in a lot of the food because I just don't want to carry that many. Right. So I only have to carry for half the Camino. Got and it. I could probably get something similar if I hit here, but it just sets up a whole problem. Uh, I decided to take a day off and then be investigated. And they, the, the woman there is real good on the computer. She went back and forth. Finally, they found out the package was in the Correos in Leon. Oh, good. And they had said, we tried calling you here at the, at the hostel. We tried, um, we stopped a few times to drop it. No one answered. They said, "We our phone rings all the time. We have pilgrims coming in, people that stay here, people that use the door when they ring in. That doesn't make any sense that none of us would have responded. Hmm. Like how many times? And they said, well, it is here. We are ready to mail it back to Madrid. If he comes down within the next two days, we can." I, I ran down to that post <laughs> office. And when they handed it to me, I put it in my arms and rocked it like it was my baby. Oh my <laughs> because now I can continue on to Santiago. It was such a big moment. And it rarely ever happens in, in how many years of Camino. They're very efficient. What happened there, I do not know. Hmm. But it's, uh, I almost, within a day or two of going home. Yeah, so uh, wow. that's just another thing about the mailing parts of my... Right. Uh, but the other foods I carry, uh, I'll carry a glucose tablets. I carry some in my pocket. Okay. Uh, I also carry a glucose gel, which athletes use for sure. quick fuel okay. for athletes use them in runners. Uh, that has it's pure glucose. It's, you suck it right down, uh, squeeze it out of the tube. And it also has a little bit, I get the kind that have caffeine in them. Okay. Because it speeds it into your bloodstream a little quicker. Okay, you might gain it. a few minutes if you start to go really low. I have a whole bunch of those I'm taking home. I hardly used any, that's a good sign of my control. And part of it is this new CGM that I'm using for the first time on Camino. I, I don't get that low now, Okay. but I still carry them. And then the, the ultimate uh, problem is uh, I carry, uh, that there, you can have a problem with diabetes. The, the, the low is so severe that you actually have a glucagon. It's pure glucose. Generally used to be a syringe that you ah. take out, you pop it in. The, the new one I have is actually, you can use it by inhaling. Oh, really? So I have a very small one. They're really expensive. Yeah. My endocrinologist gives me one every two years after that one uh, expires. I never used it. I've only used the syringe one one time in my life when I had some type of virus and as I came out of the virus, 
suddenly my blood sugar dropped off yeah. the table where it had been like really high during the virus. I gave myself a shot. It's the only time I've ever used it, but I carry one in the pack all the time. All the time. So Bob, um, I'm curious, do you, when you're walking with other people on the Camino, do you tell them that mm -hmm. you do have diabetes once yeah. so that they're aware? Yep, I talk about it. Sometimes most of them have a relative. Okay. Yeah, a friend. And yeah. then we discuss it. And so do you wear some type of identification bracelet? Yeah, is there something on your backpack yep, that identifies? Oh, not not on the backpack. I have cards in the okay. backpack, uh, and I give them out too. You do diabetes crusader. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I wear a necklace. Okay. Yeah, has all my info that when you access the necklace, it uh, gives you all my info. Yeah. Uh, and then um, I tell people, and a lot of times when I do my change out. As I scrub up and get ready to do it and make everything sterile, the where I'm doing it, it could be at an albergue table in the kitchen or even on my bed if there's no other way. Uh, I will make everyone of uh, uh, you know say, "Listen, I'm going to be changing my pump." If you're interested, you I, you can watch me. That would be great. You know, very few people do it, but occasionally they have and. A lot of those people have gone on to be my best friends on the Camino oh, wow. because I think it was a show of one, their humanity, that mm -hmm. they wanted to see what I was going through. Number two, a, a sort of uh, that they were curious. You know, yes. and I always like people who are curious yes. uh, about anything. And but this is about, oh, let me see what you do. And yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So, you know, if, if I were to be walking with somebody and they tell me that they have diabetes mm -hmm. one, what kind of things should I be watching out for? You know, how could I help them if their insulin would get so low that something would happen and they would need assistance? Yeah. First of all, probably the first thing I do is I ask them, say, hey, could you give me one of those um, gels? I'll keep it in my pocket every huh. day that we're walking. Even if I don't see you for a couple of days, it's only one gel. You're not going right. to miss it. But if I see you later and I'm taking off, I'll give it back to you. But I'll carry that in my pocket every day. And I then you have that's a backup system to the backup system. And uh, yeah, so that would work. Uh, they could make you available to the glucagon because it's usually on my bedside okay. at a table or on the floor right next to the bed. And then it goes right back into the pack the next morning in the upper compartment. They could know that too if they don't that they know that's where it's located in your pack. Okay. But then at night in the, and you know, in all those things, we're always worried about just dropping off the table after a real strenuous day after climbing Osobrero or something. Right. Uh, but now with this new CGM, once again, it's it would warn me before would warn. I would get and, that and low. Would others, others would hear the, the hear beeping, the beeping right? And then they might. And the few times it happened this year, I think it happened twice, uh, somebody yelled from one of the bunk beds are you okay and i said yeah i'm arresting it right now great i said but thank you for asking oh that's yeah. wonderful yeah that's wonderful yep great okay well let's pause here for a moment and then we'll change topics not a doctor i don't have any medical background i've lived with this all my life and i'm out there all the time you know, living the life that I am talking about. So, and it does work for me because I'm still out here, still doing Caminos, but it goes back to, uh, back in, uh, in 1987, when I became the first diabetic in America to actually type one diabetes, to walk a six day race in which I walked 274 miles in six days, uh, which would be something like 400, 15 kilometers or something uh, over a six day period. So about uh, 73 kilometers a day for six straight days or 46 miles for, for six great days. And then that's where I started to become more vocal and in the public with my diabetes because I was proving now that a diabetic could complete a race such as that. That is so uh, impressive. Huh? Yeah. And then, uh, and then it worked yeah. into the 90s when I started walking across states and doing diabetes programs at night. 
and sleeping in fire companies and a couple times in jail and the extra <laughs> cell that wasn't being used. Wait, you voluntarily because, went yeah, to jail? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because I had nowhere to sleep in that town. And they said, well, you could sleep in the jail unless we have a big run on, the, you know, in these little towns, they really hardly use the jail. So uh, that's dedication, yeah. And in the Bob. fire, in the fire halls, you had to be aware of the fact that if there was a fire at night, you would wake up because they would all be on alert and they would have to go fight the fire and, and that but it never happened so I was fine but anyway those I started doing states and I thought well you know this is a crusade at this point I am out there doing this to, to show people what I do with my diabetes and then it's and then in 1997 I started walking across America I started at the Pacific Ocean in Washington State and across Ohio, uh, Idaho Montana North Dakota and Minnesota Michigan, uh, Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey, finishing at the Atlantic Ocean uh, in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Uh, it was three years, two months on the walk, 10 months at home working. Back two months, and we always drove, we had a motor home with logos up from all the diabetes companies that were supporting us. And then we would go back, drive back to the point where we had to stop and start again and vice versa. You know, that just happened over a three year period. So it's now 2000. Uh, and we talked about it slowly as we got towards the end. My crew, which were just wonderful friends and family that had helped me maintain the whole thing. We said, this is a good idea. We should continue this around the rest of America. <laughs> So now we, you were the only one walking though. Yeah, I was the only one walking right? day to day. <laughs> My friends walked with me or they would run the motor home ahead to a predetermined point, usually eight miles, walk back to meet me. Uh -huh. They get back three or four and then back. So they sometimes got near the same, another eight. So we did about 20 to 25 miles a day. Wow. So yeah. I wanted to jump in because during our break, you, you mentioned two things that I think are really important about your story and and the first one is that your philosophy has been to not tell people what to do in controlling their diabetes but actively showing them show them what you're doing because it has worked yes and it, what happened was as we went then down the pacific coast in across the south the, the we followed the deserts through uh the border near the mexican border uh, we went there in November, and December, so it wasn't be hot. It was actually perfect. It was 70 degrees uh, in Texas. We followed the Rio Grande, and then all the way across the South, and then up the Atlantic coast, back to New Jersey, complete circle. And driving in and out each year, we would go through the middle. So we hit almost every state. But the time I spent on the Native American reservations, mm. which there are anywhere from 60 to 70 of them in the United States, and I was on 32 of them, they uh, respond better to the message that don't come here and tell me what to do with my diabetes. They responded to the message that I came and showed them. I didn't tell them to take a walk every once in a while. They, I walked onto their reservation, and the next day I said, we will now do a group walk. We want everyone from the reservation to come out. Where it's possible we will do a two mile walk you show me your reservation, the sacred sites, uh, give me a, a lesson on that. And at the same time, we're, we're walking, we're doing some good, and then maybe continue that when I leave. And then when I finally would leave a day or two later, I walk off their reservation. So I'm showing them what I do, not telling them what to do. And that message goes way beyond the Native Americans. This can go to you know anywhere in the United States and now, Europe and meeting people from all over the world uh, that this is what works for me and it's continuing to work so let's let's continue let's think about that in terms and start to incorporate some of these methods yeah. into maybe your type 2 diabetes uh, or your type 1 diabetes right. because and, you've shown yeah. I mean you've been living with this for 50 some years right it's, at it's, this point it's 40 yeah it's 48 and a half we're coming up on the 50 mile mark right and you were sharing with me earlier that some friends that you had known that had lived near you that um, d had diabetes one they have not had the same uh, experience yeah, of living with it and you attribute this to your walking yeah. so can you talk a little bit about this I used to think you know that it was just 
bad luck or I even thought it's going to happen to me too eventually and it may yet I may run into these problems it is it is a, the diabetes is a, it just wears you down mentally physically and spiritually and over time you just lose that ability to fight it and, and you know and maybe it'll happen to me I, I have no you know special powers right. or anything like that but the difference is between my friends who have gone through blindness and, uh, and or on kidney dialysis have lost limbs, uh, which is quite common, unfortunately, in America with diet long term, long term diabetes, or even short term for people with type two. Uh, it happens all the time. Some of my friends have passed on, right. and they all have diabetes around the same time I did. The one main difference between me and them is they're very intelligent people. They're they're you know progressive. They're, we, they will take to the message of the tools of diabetes. But it's that I insist on uh, continually walking at least two miles every other day. That's the bare minimum. Let's and if start you can with do the that, bare you were telling me earlier that scientifically it's proven that if you are walking, yep. so talk a little bit about that. Just the walk just helps you to maintain, first of all, it helps to maintain weight, helps to synthesize the food you eat. Uh, you know, you're now becoming even an athlete. If you were never an athlete, you're a little overweight and you're getting older and you never... No, you're an athlete. You're walking two miles every other day. You're becoming an athlete in your own mind. And if you think of it in that terms, now maybe try to do it every day if you can, especially if you're retired now. If not, you work all day, you get, you know, you're tired. Walking doesn't make you tired. Walking actually energizes. Mm. So you go out, you walk at night, and then you sleep better and you go to work and you work your hard job possibly. But maybe even, maybe a one mile walk and then a walk to work. My wife always walked to work and back. She's not diabetic, but she just said she was, she was a model in our town for, well, you know, Nancy walks to work one mile every day and walks home one mile every day. But then she still goes out and walks with her husband at night, you know, or something like that. Right. Uh, so, and she's retired now So your whole years. family has taken this on. This is, this is like just, just normal. It's just we right. always and I should walk. say, I should say, you're, you've walked with your kids. Your kids, the have kids have come and walked with, me with all you. around America. My youngest, mostly my older, they're five years apart, my daughter. Okay. The younger one was home on a lot of the American stuff, but they would fly out and meet me too, my okay. wife and the younger one. The older one was with me a lot on that their walk. Right. And, and then how, what about walking the Camino? Has the your Camino, wife walked with you it, on no, the Camino? And the, you no, know, Camino, it's been my younger one who's okay. been with me a few weeks. She works at a hospital in the healthcare industry on diabetes. She's a diabetes specialist. Oh, really? Yes. And she... She has been with me uh, all through, uh, all, up until now, because she now has a baby. Uh, she, this is the first year she did not come with me. Okay. Uh, and so we already have plans to get use the jogging stroller in a year or two, maybe, and take them on with us on the, it'll be a, a, a smaller portion, maybe a week, but we'll work our way up. You know, my other uh, daughter's uh, son is seven and a half. And he will, he can walk now. And he, I keep telling him about the Camino. I said, oh, he's the bulls, You're running with the bulls in Pamplona. And of course, we're not going to do that. But, you know, the bull fights of, of Pamplona and Madrid. And he, he's starting to get, like, you know, curious. And he's like, I don't want to walk with Pap Pap, you know. Well, you've so, got a great story about him, which let's let's get to that in a moment. Yes. So let's take a break here. Yes. And okay. we'll talk about uh, yes. how your grandson about incorporated grandson. himself into this Camino. Yes, he has. <laughs> coffee we headed over to the pilgrim house and faith and nate were kind enough to allow us to do some recording there if you haven't been to the pilgrim house yet uh, please check it out there are so many resources there it's a great place to hang out it's free it's comfortable it's lovely and i hope that this interview gives you a little taste of what it's like So we're back and this time we are at the Pilgrim House, which is just a great place that every pilgrim should come visit. We are in the back room. 
and you can see how beautiful it is here. Uh, so beautiful that we had trouble picking out just where we would film. Uh, it's a little too chilly to be outside on the lovely patio, so Bob and I have settled ourselves here and we're going to talk now just about this latest pilgrimage that he completed. So uh, let's just talk about, you've been walk. you walked, it was, uh, I think you said 33 days this time? Is yes. that about right? Yes. So let's talk a little bit about where was your favorite stop this time? I mean, this was your fourth time on the Frances, so, you know, it's not new for you, but every time we walk, it's just a little bit different, right? Right. So what did you find this time? Where was your favorite stop? Yeah, uh, you know, and it, what it happens is each time you do this, uh, you pick up some new favorite places, and then when you come back, you may find that you either skip that place or they, at this time, because of me not being here for three years, things weren't always open that were open those other three times. So then I had to start to pick up some new places. One that was continuous for me for all four was in the Leon Hostel in, in, in Leon, right around the corner from the cathedral. That place is way up on the third floor building. It's a beautiful looking building. And that's those people there as a young couple, I've seen their kids grow up mm -hmm. uh, over the years and I stayed there again. And I usually mail my medical supplies ahead there. Uh, so that's another big factor and they know how to deal with that. And they took care of that again this year. So that's definitely, Leon is probably always going to be on my list. And not only because of that place, but just Leon in general. I just think it's one of my favorite cities in the world. No, I love it too. Yeah, there. I just love there. Um, in, in some of the, in, in the Masetta, uh, probably uh, as you get towards the end at Mancias de Mulas, that's one day out of Leon, there I, um, I hadn't seen... Uh, I stayed at the same uh, Albergue Gaia. They, the people there were the same. They recognized me right away when I got there. So that was like a homecoming to me. I showed them pictures from three years ago when I walked through there when they were, uh, when, when, you know, and I, and I took a picture of them now and I put them side by side. I said, you guys haven't changed at all, even though we went through some very trying times. And they said it was, financially very difficult, but they maintained it and they looked forward that night. There were 10 pilgrims there. So they saw the change coming and that it is coming back the Camino. So that was a big plus for me. The night before that, uh, in, in one stage beyond that, the, it was a municipal albergue and there was a fire that heated the place and mm. the fire was right below the albergue it was upstairs. So it heated the floor. So the house penal arrow said, I live a few blocks away. I will not put you in charge of the fire. So you got to come down every couple hours, <laughs> set your alarm, and then and, and rake the fire. If it needs a few more pieces of wood, put it in there. Uh, it's out back the wood. And then uh, tomorrow morning around 6 o'clock, come down and load it up with wood. I'll be here soon around 6.37. And then the fire will be here for you to eat breakfast. And it was very cold that night. So that was my job. And I... I was great with that. I was fine getting up in the morning and doing that. So, wow. yeah. So what keeps you coming back uh, and returning to the Frances and, and doing all these Caminos? You know, this was your eighth one. What makes you want to do them again? It, the landscapes are important and they always have been since I was a kid and I grew up in a rural part of Pennsylvania and was always in the woods. So the landscapes are there. They will continue to be. Um, the camaraderie of the people you meet along the way that you're walking with every day, that's important. But it all comes down to people, the mm -hmm. hospitaleros, the people running the bars, yes. the people you're walking with from all around the world who you meet and walk a few days with. And then, and then soon you, you acquire more. Some go ahead, some stay behind, some go home. They, Europeans tend to do this in one and two week segments because right. they do have easy access by train and that from the countries in, in Europe. Uh, so you're going to miss them now and you have to then, you know, uh, have a sad goodbye. And then, but then more pilgrims take their place. And that, that aspect of it is unlike anything I've done, walks all over North America 
but nothing has that kind of a camaraderie and uh, it, it's almost like a union yeah. of type of uh, uh, it's it, there's there's spiritual overtones in it and to learn about their countries just in talking to them even though you have not never visited may never visit that's a sort of yeah, a thing yeah, let's explore that a little bit because some people have said to me, you know, why not just stay in the U.S. and walk all the great trails? You know, we've got the Appalachian, which you live near. Yep. It's in your backyard. Uh, you've walked the PCT. You've walked all the big ones, really, in the yeah. U.S. as well as walking across the United States and all around the United States. Um, but yet, you feel something different when you're here on the Camino, and and that's the thing that's so hard to find words for. But there is a difference There's here, wouldn't difference. you say, then the, the camaraderie, the people that you meet, um, I just don't feel like I find that when I'm in the U.S. hiking. So could you no, speak to that a it's, bit? it's totally different. The, everyone here is willing to help everyone else out, and it's it's a communal thing. It's I think the Spanish word for it might be, and it's also an anthropological term, uh, Communitas. Mm, uh, sometimes yeah. in America they said uh, uh, it's it's communal. Yes. The meal at night in an albergue, whether it be Granyon or uh, any of those places where you have the communal mule, uh, meal, and uh, which could be anywhere from five pilgrims to 20, 30 pilgrims, uh, that is very special. And uh, it, it breaking bread together, uh, drinking wine together, that that's a big deal. Uh, so that's and and then there's these factors that people have uh, speculated about. It, it can come from uh, philosophy, from spirituality, or or even even from mythology and and things that we have these ley lines that run through these. Uh, the whole com uh, Camino, uh, you know, underground uh, vectors yes. of some kind of energy. The Native Americans who I've met on my walk across America said that is actually a thing. They said, they call it places of big medicine, mm. like uh, Big Sur, the yeah. 90 mile part of the coast there, uh, the Grand Canyon, yep. uh, you know. So they say that is very true. And people I've talked to about the Camino who know these things say, yeah, there there is a lot to that, and mm. and there is it's uh, it's palpable in in a way that you feel those things. The fact that the Milky Way, if you ever go out at night, sometimes I set my alarm <laughs> for two in the morning. Yeah, I tell all the pilgrims, look, I'm sorry, but the minute I hear it, I'll stop it off. But if you hear it and you want to see the Milky Way, we're at a point now where it's clear tonight. We're up on a mountain. You got those dark skies. We've got to do this. It, probably the best place was on the Camino del Norte, a little town called Maraz, yeah. which is way up there a few days before you complete the Camino del Norte, uh, where I went out and uh, nobody else wanted to get up. But that's, people are tired and they need their sleep. But a German uh, a woman came out with me and we stood with blankets wrapped around mm -hmm. us for a half an hour just looking at that Milky Way it was like, it felt like when I shut my headlight off after we walked out beyond the, the lights of the little town, it like, whoa, it like, it almost uh, uh, made you go, it, it almost scared you that it was that close. Is, is it falling on us? <laughs> and the idea that they call it the Milky Way, the Via Lactea, yeah. the fact that when the shooting stars, which were going off all the time, if they look like they, like you flinched a little bit, whoa, is it falling on me? Is it, it, it can I feel the dripping of the milk? <laughs> the Milky Way is dripping upon us mm. and it's all oh, an optical illusion, but it was really, that was another factor to think that the ancients would, would sometimes walk at night and because it was less dangerous too, so that they wouldn't be seen, that they could walk uh, by following it from one end to the other, yeah. to Santiago. That's a major thing. You've got to go out a couple times on each, each uh, every time you do the Camino and see it at least, if not only once. I didn't see it a lot this year. I had a lot of cloudy mm -hmm. weather and, uh, and it was cold and at times, but I did get to see it a few times. There is, that's a spectacular sight that is cosmic. 
and you got to make the effort at least once per Camino to see the Milky Way, mm, the yes. Via Lactea. I totally agree. Yeah. When I was spending time in Rabinal, it was wonderful to go out at night. Rabinal would oh, be a place. Yes, I mean the dark sky there and the stars. I've just never seen stars as yes. bright as the other places. Yeah. Fonse Bidon is really yeah. good for that. Yeah. Um, and then you can almost see the lights off in the distance of Astorga, too, where yes. you've just come from. So that's another, uh, yeah. Yeah. So earlier you were saying something about, we were talking about community and about how, you know, we start off and we walk alone. You know, it is a solo pilgrimage. It is within, yeah. However, we never really tend to walk alone. And we were talking no. about, I think you mentioned some kind of quote that you had for that, or we were talking about folks that you had yeah. walked with. So. Um, Pilgrims walking the road to Santiago understand that in life there are no beginnings and endings, only passages, passages and transformations. Mm. So you have, yeah, and when you think each day, the period you walk from one place to another is a passage. Yes. Life is a passage every year or even in periods of 10 years in space, how, how you cope with the world. It's, it's, a tra it's a passage. But in the same time, during those passages, you are being transformed. There is transformation going on within. And, uh, and life in general, the Camino mimics the journey of life. Yes. There is absolutely no... I've been doing journeys all my life. I know journeys. And the Camino is a big part of that. Oh, that's wonderful. And I think we'll close with, I, I wanted to have you just mention, you have an epic, an epic journey getting ready to come up where you will be celebrating 50 years of not just living with diabetes one, but thriving as you live with yes. it. So tell everyone what you have planned for September of 2023. Yeah, the survival is, it, it, uh, the story is not just surviving type two, but sometimes you feel like you're just surviving it, but thriving within it. Yes. That's, that's what I'm celebrating. Uh, I would like to do it, uh, a big walk, and I've been throwing around different ideas as to where, but I think the one I've come up with, with uh, really, and this may change over time, but it's, it's only like a year and a half, two years away from when I want to do it. But uh, I've been uh, a bit obsessed with the Black Madonnas in some of those churches in uh, France. Uh, I saw it when I walked from, uh, from La Puy and Belay years ago. I, I, that's when it started this obsession. And then I've been places since along that route and even other places. And there's some in Spain too, or hit right. some, because a lot of them have been burned mm -hmm. because they were sort of sacrilegious to the, the leaders of the churches. And, you know, they came possibly from Ethiopia, which is like, that even make that furthers the fascination for me. And, uh, but the, there's, a, there's a few yet in some of the cathedrals in Toulouse, mm -hmm. France. So I'd like to start there. I've always, always wanted to see the castle at Carcassonne which was right near there, just maybe in a train ride away. Uh, so that area as a starting point, working my way to halfway uh, beyond, uh, on the GR65 via Potenensis, uh, the La Puy to uh, say Jean de Pédéport route, which I've already done. I would get to Cahors, one of my favorite cities in the world, surrounded by the rivers, almost like a horseshoe and uh, the epic bridge as you leave town, that just, that place really fascinates me. I'd like to go there again it's, it's, and then walk from there to Saint Jean Pédipour up and over the Pyrenees, walk the entire Francis, this point would be my fifth time. And then when I get here, one more big stage and that's to walk from here to Moxia along the coast back to Finisterre and then back to Santiago. So I'm calling it from the Black Madonnas of Toulouse to the end of the world. Wow, that sounds amazing. And you're having friends that are joining you. That's the big story of it, is that we're going to downgrade our mileage a little bit, take a little longer, because we want to make it open to people even who, not have, who have not walked before. But the big news is 100, 150 pilgrims who I have met from all over the world, and some have come back to walk with me again. We've become friends and keep in touch with social media. Those friends will 
pick and choose a week or two somewhere along that route and jump in and, and, and it will be a moving celebration for me once again for surviving and thriving with type 1 diabetes. So as the walk is what, walking has been the thing that has kept me alive and thriving, I feel. And so what, what better way to then celebrate it is by walking and across epic places in, in France and Spain and having those friends who have supported me all these years to join in and even if it's just for a week at a time and uh, that this will be a moving celebration across those landscapes. Well, you just picked up another pilgrim that wants to walk with you a stage or two. You're, you're because... in. <laughs> pick, your, <laughs> pick your place and, and research it and say, which one would I like to <laughs> see yes. again? Or which one would I, have I not seen and want to see? Yeah. Well, Bob, it has been an absolute delight meeting you today. I've been following your story. I don't know at what point I met you online, but it has been a true treat to meet you today and hear yes. more of your story and become familiar with the things that you've done. And I'm just so impressed uh, by all of your walks. And, and I, I, I don't, did we bring it up in the, it's been, we've been talking for a while yeah. about my uh, companion for the entire No, walk. we have not. Oh, I'm so glad you did. Oh, thank you for reminding me. All right, everyone. So now listen, he's got, your grandson is seven years old. Seven and a half, yep. And what's his name? Miles. Miles. So before you got ready to leave for this Camino, Miles came to you and said something to you, which just warms my heart to no end. So tell us about what Miles said to you and what you brought with you. Yeah, for my birthday, which was two weeks before I left for here, he, for my birthday, he got me a Baby Yoda stuffed animal, you know, a stuffed From Star Yoda. Wars. <laughs> yes, from uh, The Mandalorian and Boba Fett, you know. So Baby Yoda... Uh, and and he said, Pap, Pap, you take Baby Yoda with you, and he will uh, he will give you advice. He will school you in the ways of, of a Jedi, and uh, he and and then because I may the Force be with you, and so I pinned him into my upper pocket of my backpack, and he's looking back because if you remember, if you've seen the Mandalorian, Baby Yoda floats behind the Mandalorian. So he sort of was positioned <laughs> to do that. And people would come upon me from behind or see it at night in the Alberta and like, baby Yoda's, look at, there he is. And I said, yeah, he's been with me the whole journey. And he did make it yesterday. And we got all kinds of pictures of baby Yoda. Uh, all, you could almost see him grinning a little more than <laughs> when I started, you know, it hasn't changed, but it looks like he was truly part of that epic walk that I just completed. Yeah. And this is one of the things I just love about your story. First of all, I've been following a lot of your posts and you had things about Baby Yoda with you, but I didn't know that that was because of your grandson. Yes. So the fact yes. that Miles gave that to you. But one of the things I loved about meeting you today is hearing how your whole family has been involved with your diabetes crusade. Yes, they have. And that your kids have walked the Camino with you, that you're planning that when you do this next epic journey, there's going to be some stroller pushing with your grandbabies yes, coming. And it's, it's just been wonderful to hear that even, I think you mentioned earlier that even your daughter went into the healthcare field and is working. Um, She's a diabetes educator at a hospital. Yeah. Deals and, with diabetes patients every day. Yeah. Yes. It's just a testament to you, Bob. I think that you really have lived this mission of yours of not lecturing to people about diabetes and, but by showing through your actions how to thrive with it and the things that people can do to help control it and maybe if they have diabetes too, how to reverse it um, and that you're trying to bring light to diabetes one so that hopefully someday we find a cure so that people don't have to ever live with it. That's the ultimate, yeah, end point. Uh, and, and also to, to for them, what I would love is for them to plan some kind of epic adventure on any scale um, and do plan for it, do it, and, and come home and feel that glow after you get home from doing that, knowing that that is going to help you control your diabetes 
when you're back home, when you're alone back home. I've been away three years, but during that time, the Caminos I've done before still informed me and when days when I felt when I was really low and missing it and heart sick, homesick for Spain, that those memories could never be taken away. Yes. So get out there and create some. That's that's the ultimate. And that's for diabetics and non-diabetics. Well said. We will end it there. Thank you so much, Bob. Okay. Thanks so much to Bob for coming to the Camino Cafe and talking about how he lives and thrives still with Diabetes One. Let's hope we find a cure someday soon. If you enjoyed listening to this interview or watching this interview, I hope that you will subscribe. If you're watching on YouTube, give us a thumbs up, make a comment, I'll comment back. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify, again, subscribe. And if you're on Apple, can you give us a five-star rating to help us get the podcast uh, out there into the world? I hope to see you next week. Cosas que necesito en la vida ya están aquí. Las cosas que necesito en la vida.